good afternoon or good morning. Sweden, the Middle Way was the title of a book published in 1936 by the American journalist Marcus Childs. The book became an international bestseller, one that even impressed, impressed the US President Franklin Roosevelt. He said that the Swedish model was worth studying because, quote, in Sweden you have a royal family and a socialist government and a capitalist system all working happily side by side, unquote. Despite the later criticism of the book for its generalities and inaccuracies, Sweden, the middle way, has had a huge influence on the way in which Sweden has been viewed by the world ever since. After the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, this small country of the northern periphery of Europe has surprised the world. Sweden has been and is the focus of much international attention because of our, well, compared to many other countries, lack of hard-nosed regulations. Instead, Sweden has relied on trusting the public to act responsibly, using common sense, as Prime Minister Stefan Löfven said. That is, social distancing, washing your hands, work at home if possible, and don't go out if you have anything that resembles COVID-19 symptoms. Sweden has not imposed a nationwide lockdown or curfews, not even for a limited period of time. And we have kept large, part, large parts of our society open since the pandemic started. The Swedish authorities have Swedish authorities have said that the basis of Sweden's containment plan is to try to keep transmission rates at a level that the health system can sustain, to flatten out the curve. They have again and again denied that herd immunity forms the central thrust of the Swedish strategy. Some find our measures to meet the current crisis shocking and irresponsible. Others speculate whether this strategy could perhaps be copied. The first case of COVID-19 in Sweden was confirmed on January 31st and the first death on March 9 in the Stockholm region. Since then the pandemic has spread all over the country, the province of Stockholm being for long the most affected. The situation in Sweden today, on May 24, is that we have more than 30,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and, as of today, 4,000 deaths. This puts Sweden below countries with a higher mortality, countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, Spain and Germany, but also far above countries with a much lower number of COVID-19 related deaths. Countries like Japan, South Korea, Denmark, Finland and Norway. Sweden, the middle way. It is especially compared to our Nordic neighbors that Sweden sticks out. The number of deaths in Sweden are high, higher than in Denmark, Norway and Finland put together, both in absolute terms and in relation to the populations. An explanation to the Swedish way is perhaps to be found in the relation between the political power and the civil service. In many countries abroad, politicians have, in a situation like this, the power to institute harsh regulations, closing down parts of the, closing down parts of the society, but not but not so in Sweden. Here, there is a tradition of independent agencies run by experts who are free to make their own recommendations regardless of, politicians, of the politicians. The public is expected to follow and also do so to a large extent, the recommendations from the government agency 
responsible for public health, Folkhälsomyndigheten, the Public Health Agency of Sweden. Since the pandemic started, this agency gives a press conference every day at two o'clock local time. It is broadcast live in all major medias and also attended by several journalists, several journalists from foreign news agencies. This daily press conference is followed by a large part of our entire population. A Swedish journalist wrote ironically that the Swedes gather daily around this press conference as a sort of comforting campfire, huddling around it to get some warmth in the form of figures and statistics given with calm voices and reassuring body language by the expert in the panel on the stage in front of the media. The central character at these press conferences is the state epidemiologist Anders Tegnell, who has become somewhat of a media figure. He's being looked upon as a guru and, not unlike what happens to many Nobel laureates, he's asked by the media to give his views on topics which are outside his competence and experience. Questions which ought to be the subject for the government. A key question for the politicians is to balance what it takes to keep the economy going and at the same time providing, protecting the citizens, especially the elderly and vulnerable, as best as possible. Or put more bluntly, although this is never said openly, how many deaths of Swedish citizens are we prepared to accept in order to keep the Swedish economy vital. It should be said that the head of the Swedish Public Health Agency, Anders Tegnell, who has held this position since 2013, is a well-educated and much experienced physician specializing in infectious disease with a PhD in medicine from Linköping University and Master of Science in Epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He has, for example, worked for WHO in Laos and in Zaire in 1995 during the Ebola epidemic. He played a major role in Sweden's response to the 2009 swine flu pandemic. These biographical data on the most central figure on the stage of the Swedish COVID-19 drama is mentioned because Tegnell typifies the well-educated and experienced Swedish civil servant, a public authority of the kind that we Swedes by tradition respect and put such a high level of trust in, and have so done since the 17th century. More on this later. Anders Tegnell has been far more visible and talkative than Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, the leader of the Social Democratic Party. A recent survey showed that about 70% of the Swedish population had trust in Tegnell, a higher figure than for any of the Swedish political leaders. Some media has, blamed, has claimed that the Prime Minister has been hiding behind the civil servant Tegnell. This, however, might be unfair because the two ministers in the government responsible for finance, Magdalena Andersson, and social affairs, Lena Hallengren, have both been and are highly visible when communicating new decisions by the government on financial measures and health regulations. Has Sweden made a terrible mistake in not instituting more severe restrictions? Or has Sweden found a middle way that in the end, the day when all the data has been collected worldwide and can be compared, will prove to have been successful both for limiting the human disaster and to keep the economy going? Today, no one can tell. But Sweden sticks to its policy. This is not to say that this is an anonymous decision shared by all citizens, organizations, industry, political parties, etc. No, there is a constant, ongoing, 
sometimes harsh debate, often quoting what is being said abroad about us. But nevertheless, Sweden muddles on and hopefully through on its chosen path. In order to attempt to explain why, we need to take a longer historical perspective. The origin of the Swedish way can be found in an almost 400 year old tradition in the Swedish civil service. This was a reform that was instituted in the early 17th century. During the 30 years war, Axel Oxenstierna, the closest collaborator of King Gustavus Adolphus II, was the architect of the creation of an administrative system that is the origin of the Swedish civil service. Oxenstierna created a number of central agencies, Kollegier, in 1620 to 1640, with a division of power which still exists today. Administratively speaking, these agencies belong to or are sorted under the various ministers of the government, but, but, and this is the central point, they are not under the command of the ministries. No, they are totally independent to make their own decisions and recommendations. The Minister of Education, for example, is not directing the agency for schools, Skolverket, which has its own independent director, general director. This independence of the state agencies was confirmed once again in the constitutional law of 1974, Regeringsformen, 1974. This is not to say that everything was in good order in Sweden when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. No, the outbreak in early 2020 found Sweden by and large unprepared. For example, it was so noted that Sweden had a relatively low number of hospital beds per capita and also few intensive care units, unit beds per capita. Both numbers were lower than for most countries in the European Union. Another example. In March, the spread of the coronavirus occurred in retirement homes all over the country. A ban on visits by relatives and friends to the elderly was put in effect on April 1. But this came too late. More than a third of the deaths related to COVID-19 in Sweden have occurred in homes for the elderly. One reason was perhaps that the conditions for the staff working in nurse nursing homes have been degrading, degraded during the last decades. Having low salaries, they could ill afford to stay at home even if they showed symptoms of the illness. There was also a lack of the most elementary protection equipment for the staff in nursing homes and hospitals, resulting in a heated and confused debate with contrasting view of what measures are needed to give an acceptable protection. The Swedish Health Service is not centralized. The nation's 21 regions are free to pass their own regulations. Now this, this decentralization has been questioned in the wake of the pandemic. A reason for the lack of medical equipment was perhaps that Sweden has more and more relied on international supplies. Supply chains that have been built on principles of a free international market. We have believed in globalization, trusting that we lived in the global village. Who could produce and sell the most cost-effective cost -effective medical supplies? Lately, there has been a lack of anesthetic needed to put very sick patients to sleep for weeks and ventilators. Veterinarians and private cosmetic surgeons have been accused of using anesthetic that rather should be used for the COVID-19 patients in intensive care units. Now, back to the state epidemiologist Anders Tegnell. On having been elected a fellow of the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences, 
Kungliga Krigsvetenskapsakademin in 2005. Tegnell gave a very interesting and today even more so inaugural lecture. Here he spoke on the effect of pandemics on society. He listed ongoing epidemics in the world at the time. HIV, AIDS, cholera, malaria, SARS and others and warned for it the danger of future pandemics. A danger that would need preparations and investments almost similar to those of the military defence, both of which have been, had been downgraded in Sweden during the last decades in terms of financial and political support. The risks for either a military conflict after the Cold War or a pand pandemic had both been deemed increasingly low. Tegnell said that compared to the cost for military defense, all expenditure in preparing for future pandemics, quote, are pure profits, unquote, rent vinstgivande. Tegnell said this in 2007, 13 years ago. Changes. Well, the COVID-19 has changed the political landscape in Sweden. For the time being, or permanently, so remains to be seen. Anyhow, recent polls show that the dominating Social Democratic Party has strengthened the public support by several percentages. This is not surprising. In a crisis, the public tends to support the government in charge, trusting the current helmsman. This change has led to a correspond corresponding reduction of the support for the populist right-wing party, Sverigedemokraterna, as well as for the Centre Liberal Party, Liberalerna, and the Green Party, Miljöpartiet. The latter two would not even make it to the parliament again had, been a, had there been a general election today. The decline of the Green Party might be an indication of what is to come when it one day comes to getting the economy on its feet again and up and running, the environmental concerns will properly play the second fiddle. Changes in the economy. Well, broadly speaking, Sweden is suffering similar hardships as all other countries, with massive layoffs, store closings, companies going out of business and a growing unemployment rate, now 8.2%, but approaching 10%. For example, SAS, the Scandinavian airline system, has reduced its workforce by 10,000 persons and reduced its flights by 90%. The Swedish government has instituted huge financial support to compensate companies for laying off personnel temporarily, a decision which has been met approvingly by most politicians, trade unions and companies alike. Sweden may be different from other countries, from other nations, due to the fact that our economy was in a very good shape when the pandemic broke out. Our barns were well stored. Nevertheless, we foresee a growing unemployment rate and a drastically reduced GDP by 7 to 10 percent this year. In general, in general, already existing problems in Sweden are increased due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The already poor will be poorer, already existing social, economic and educational differences will increase. As I sit here in our apartment in Stockholm in self-isolation since more than two months, except for a daily walk, all on the recommendations from the, from the Public Health Agency, I can't help asking myself, what are we waiting for? That a medicine curing the effects of the disease will be found? That a vaccine will be available within soon? 
that testing will be available for all citizens, that the curve will flatten out so I can be certain of getting sufficient medical treatment once I'm infected, that we will achieve herd immunity so we can move around relatively safe, that the R0, the basic reproduction number, will approach zero and the pandemic disappear. These are good questions and no one knows the answer to them at present. While we dutifully follow the recommendations of the public health agency, we live in a state of uncertainty and with a growing feeling that we will probably need to learn to live with this disease and that the future for our children and grandchildren will be much different that they will live in a totally different world from the one we had the benefit to experience. A poorer world with more international and national tensions. These are gloomy prospects, no matter from which national platform you view the world. It may turn out that the way Sweden choose to follow will in the end turn out to have led us to the same des destination as all other countries in terms of deaths per capita and overall effects on the economy. There was no middle way for Sweden. Thank you.